Okay, so let me start over. My name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and I'm pleased to be working in support of the New York Forest Owners Association initiative, which is Restore New York Woodlands. This is a, a great effort and an important effort. It's, uh, it's the kind of thing that's very much needed in New York, and the, the committee, the Restore New York Woodlands Committee, has done an absolutely outstanding job in putting materials together. So I'm, I'm pleased to be able to assist where I can. Uh, today's webinar is going to be uh, providing guidance and oversight for uh, oversight, um, an overview of information and resources that are available uh, to host sites and facilitators. So the, the woodland owners and facilitators, that the facilitator might in some cases be an owner or might be somebody that's working with an owner to host one of the woods walks that are part of the woods walk weekend or weekends uh, to the two middle weekends in the midst of May, the weekends of the 11th and the weekend of the 18th. So before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of why we're talking about Restore New York Woodlands and why we need to focus on forest restoration, let me uh, give kind of an orientation to the screen. Many of you, I think, are going to be uh, unfamiliar with this interface. This is a webinar interface. A webinar is simply a way that we and can use a web conferencing technology or web conferencing software 7 PM, so, right? that, um, so that we can share information and we can all be in different places and uh, all be looking at the same thing. So let me, I'm just going to do a, put a little message in here, sound check, can you hear me? So just if you can hear me, actually, why don't you? Type in your county where you're located from, if you can hear me. That will um, make sure, one, that you can hear me because you know that I've asked you to do that. And the other thing it will do is it will ensure that you know how to use the chat pod. And the chat pod is going to be important. Uh, this is the box at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. It should send to all participants. So scroll to make sure it sends to all participants. And then just... Um, Type that in. Good. Okay, so Chris, uh, Chris can hear but wants to adjust the volume. Uh, Chris, probably it's somewhere on the on the margin of your screen, um, or what you do, go to the communicate menu at the very top of the screen, and then select speaker microphone audio. Okay, so Dave signing in from Shenango and Mark from Steuben. We have uh, seven or eight other people. Can you let me know what county you're connecting from? This will be a <laughs> this will be an interesting webinar if no one can hear me. I have one person that's trying to teleconference and just say no that doesn't work. If you're trying to teleconference, don't. So I ended the teleconference. All right. Anybody other than Dave and Mark that can hear me? Uh, Dave can hear. All right. Well, I guess we'll forge ahead and hope that other people are just shy, won't we? Okay. So let me orient you to some other aspects of the screen. Uh, the the right hand side of the screen. So Gary says to all attendees or all participants. Uh, the attendees are just, hi Steve, thank you, welcome from Allegheny. Um, the, the attendees are 
uh, everybody other than me. So all participants is everybody. So the participants include the host is one designation. And then there are, could be presenters and panelists would be a sub-designation. And then all participants is everybody. So if you send it to all participants, everybody sees it. You can also single out an individual person if, if you're so inclined. But I think it's in general better to, very good, glad you could hear us, Chris. Um, I think it's better if we have people send it to all participants and then that way the, the questions are recorded and uh, people can see it and can see what I'm responding to. So Gary's in Tompkins County, Bonnie later, welcome to Green. Very good, very good. So everybody, I'm hoping you all can hear me. All right, so you're figuring out how to use the chat pod, and that's good. Take your time with that. Don't uh, don't be bashful to ask questions. Uh, note, though, that I cannot edit the chat box, so um, proceed appropriately. Okay, the next thing that we want to look at in the uh, upper right-hand corner, you'll see what's called the participant list, and this is a list of, you see, uh, probably my name as the host and the presenter, and then you see just a, ge a general line that says attendees. There are 10. There are zero displayed. You want to see who's here, then you click. There should be a link there. You can s click on view all attendees, and it will show you who the attendees are. So if you want to do that, you can you can check that out and see see who's involved here. All right. The next thing I'll call your attention to is the uh, the very the very top bar is on my screen is kind of blue and it says Cisco WebEx. That's just the name of this meeting, which is Restore New York Woodlands Host Facilitator Training. The next row is a row of drop-down menus, and one that will be potentially of interest to you is if you look at the use the file drop-down file menu and choose the option to save as, and then you can save as, if you click on the document option, that will give you the ability to save the agenda. So now I don't know why you would want to save the agenda, but it gives you that option. And it may be more important when we look at some of these other documents that you might be like, uh, you might like to save those. You can save them either as a PDF file or as what's called a UCF, which is a universal communications format. So that's the that's the, the primary things that we want to be talking about. Feel free, you know, take a, a very quick minute here and just look at some of the drop down menus that are available. Um, and that will give you a sense of some of the things that you can do. And I'm not exactly sure what you can see in and uh, because you can see less than what I can see as the host. Uh, but some of those things may be accessible to you. But, but certainly doing the save function is important and being able to do the, the chat in the chat pod is important. Another thing that you're able to do, if you look in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, you can adjust the size of the screen. So this is uh, potentially of interest. Um, and you can change, uh, you, can, you can make the screen so that you can see all of it. You can either directly change the percentage or you can use the zoom in or the zoom out uh, magnifying glass so that you can, you can keep track of what's, you can see the entire page or if you want to zoom in, if the text isn't big enough, then feel free to zoom in. Okay, any questions on that? Did, did anybody try and save the file just for giggles? Was everyone able to get to that point where they could do the save as? Good. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dave. Good. So I know when I ask questions like that, you're all sitting there and nodding your head, but of course I can't see you nod your head. So um, use be uh, 
be a liberal in that chat box, please. Okay, um, the the punchline of what we're going to go over here is that there are a lot of resources available, and those resources are available on the NIFOA website and uh, uh, under the Restore New York Woodlands banner. So you see the logo in the upper corner of this page. Um, we're going to spend a fair amount of time looking at the Restore New York Woodlands website. What I'm going to be uh, cautioning you of is that you can use your mouse and you can click all you want in the chat pod, but I would discourage you from clicking on the main part of the screen during the presentations. Depending upon where we might actually be on the screen and within the webinar, uh, for example, I can, so nobody click, all right? Everybody put your, your, your mouse hand under your leg so you're not tempted to click. I'm going to show you a page. And, no, nope, that's not the page. Here's the page. So here's the NIFOA page. This is a hot link, or it's, it's an embedded page. And I think we can all click on the buttons. I'm going to change it so you can't be, you aren't, you aren't tempted to do that. But if you click some of those buttons, it will take you into the web page, and you are not able to go backwards. So it would, it would leave you kind of locked in limbo, and I don't know how to get you out of that predicament. So uh, keep your clicking if you want to click something, click on the file button and save as to save the document, or click in the chat box so that you can send a note. Okay? Any questions so far? All right. Um, so the punchline to all of this is that if you get lost or you get uh, frustrated, thank you, Stephen. Uh, if you get lost or you get frustrated or you don't know what's going on or you have to leave early for whatever reason, go to the NIFOA website, that's NIFOA.org, and then click on the Restore New York Woodlands um, page. So this is, I'm showing you actually the, the Restore New York Woodlands page. Let me bring up the home page. Here's the home page, and then you just click on that logo and that would the Restore New York Woodlands logo, and that will take you to uh, all of the information about this, this Woods Walk Weekend and the broader initiative. Okay, so that's the punchline. Um, and then the final kind of uh, point of order to make is that uh, I want this to, uh, to be interactive, as interactive as we can. I realize it's, it's kind of a drag to have to, to tap to type your questions in the chat pod. I'm going to be monitoring that so I can see it. And um, if you have questions, please ask them right away, and, and I will respond to those. Or other people can also respond to them. Don't, don't hesitate to do that. OK, so let's get started. Question, uh, the first item on the agenda is why we want to focus on forest restoration. And to cover that point, I have a scaled back version of a PowerPoint presentation that I've developed that looks at uh, restoration and regeneration of the forest. And so it's, uh, there's 20 some slides. We're going to go through it relatively quickly. This is available on the internet. We'll, we'll take a look at where it's available as a full presentation. And if you want to see that full presentation, then you can, you can get it. Uh, on on the NIFOA website. Okay, so what we're what we're interested in doing is recognizing that New York is covered with beautiful forests. They're beautiful. They're ecologically important. They're economically important. Uh, they're aesthetically important. They just they provide us with things that we need as individuals and things that we need as a society. The problem is that. We often have trouble regenerating those forests, and so that's what I'm going to address here. When I say regeneration, we're talking about desirable species of trees, such as red oak, such as black cherry, such as sugar. Uh, that's red oak in the bottom. There's some red maple mixed in down there, and then there's also sugar maple. So these are desirable species. There are certainly other desirable species, but the point is we want to be able to establish that desirable understory layer. We assume then that those desirable seedlings that start, and we can see them when they're two inches or six inches tall, will grow to be 
much taller, would be 6 and 8 and 10 and then eventually 60 and 80 and 100 feet tall. But there's, there's a lot that happens between a 2 inch seedling and an 80 foot tall tree. There are some problems that exist and there were two studies that looked at this. Uh, one of these was a study that we did at Cornell through the Human Dimensions Research Unit where we were where we surveyed foresters and we asked them to go and visit a forest stand where they had previously, uh, where, they, where they knew that they, uh, there had been a harvest and the harvest was sufficient to provide enough sunlight to regenerate the forest and then to reflect on whether or not that harvest was, uh, was producing a regeneration layer that would, uh, that would form the next forest. Uh, so this is not a random sample of acreage on the ground. It's a, it's a, we tried to totally enumerate the forest or database. We worked very hard to try to get an email or a mail survey out to all of the field foresters that we could contact. And what we found, uh, based on their, their summary and a statewide, is that only 30% of the forest stands that should be regenerating were considered by these foresters as moderately or highly successful. That means that something on the order of 70% were either marginally successful or complete failures. Now clearly there's differences around the state. Uh, it's in uh, the Adirondacks, it tends to be uh, kind of intermediate. The other category, that geographic region, was more or less the lower Hudson Valley. Uh, there were there were more in the southern highlands that were highly successful, and then again variation um, on the moderate level. So you know, the point here is that we have fairly low success. Now I should point out that and this was a study that Gary Goff and I and Paul Curtis and Nancy Connolly worked on. We had set a fairly high bar to um, a fairly high bar as to how we defined successful regeneration. So that's, that comes into play uh, when we look at some of these others, um, look at another study. So Steve has uh, raised his hand. Steve, if you have a question, I don't know how to answer your question, feel free to type it in the chat pod. If there's any questions, type them in the chat pod. Okay, at the same time that we were doing our study using a human dimensions methodology, there was a study that was done by the Nature Conservancy, Rebecca Schreier and Chris Zimmerman, and they were using inven permanent plot inventory data available through the U.S. Forest Service through the, the Forest Service has a program known as Forest Inventory and Analysis, and that data is available online. And they looked at the regeneration layer, so they separated out those species uh, or those size classes of, of plants that were relatively small. So they were looking at the, uh, well, they looked at several different size classes and they created an index. And what they found is when you look at all canopy species that there was rated very good or good. Uh, so that's, we have those together, that's 68%. So that's two thirds were rated as good for species that were capable of reaching the overstory canopy. However, when they were a little more restrictive on their on their species list, and they said, "What species are are of timber value?" And we have very good and good uh, at 26 percent and 17 percent. So that's a 43 percent. So it's less than half, uh, more than a third of those plots were satisfactorily regenerating. So. Uh, from this, we can surmise, and these two studies were done independently of each other. We were unaware that there were, you know, we at Cornell were unaware that TNC was doing this, and I don't believe, I don't know if TNC was aware of our efforts or not. But it was a, it was interesting that both came to essentially the same conclusion using very different methods, and uh, because of that, we can uh, surmise that there is, or at least have very strong reason to believe and other evidence supports this, that there is a forest regeneration problem. So it, it's important to note that this is not a question of whether or not we are growing more wood. And you will hear statements from people that say, well, we're growing wood two times as fast or three times as fast as we're cutting it. Those are valid statistics in the sense that you can measure the amount of growth on trees that exist in these, typically in these permanent 
forest inventory and analysis plots and compare that to the volume of wood that's being harvested assuming that we have good data on the wood that's being harvested and you can say that there's more wood growing than there is being cut but the what's what's missing in that analysis is that the, the wood increment that's being measured as growth is being accumulated on trees that are already established. What's not being accounted for is the fact that the trees uh, are, are um, what that doesn't address is, is what's happening in the regeneration layer. And so the, the real question from a sustainability perspective is whether or not we're able to regenerate forest stands after harvesting. And foresters want to uh, want to believe and want to profess that that they can you know call the shot so to speak if you're a pool player and um, you know you can when you're when you're when you're harvesting you can assure that you're going to regrow the next forest um, the two studies that I've just mentioned suggest that there are problems with that and so we need to be thinking about what are some of the management actions, what are the barriers, and what are some of the management actions that we're going to need to cover. So there's a, a variety of different management actions that we're going to need to uh, employ in order to be successful. Today we're not going to go into those. Those are uh, you know, those are, are treated in the full webinar that I'll, I'll show you a link to a little bit later, and there are lots of other resources that are available. But the point is, we're going to have to do things differently on the ground than we have been doing if we're going to want to regenerate our forests. What I want to focus on here, in, in just in very brief uh, time frame, are the threats and strategies for regenerating hardwood forests. And Steve points out that he has lots of maple trees and no regeneration. So there's, there's uh, maybe, maybe some answers here will, will show up. Okay, so let's look at uh, threat number one is high grading. Uh, this is a stand in Saratoga County that was high graded. I'm standing on a road that uh, bisects. This was a fairly large harvest site. It was uh, owned by a family and the patriarch was quite old. He signed, a, I don't know if he actually signed a contract or not, but there was an agreement with uh, uh, this operation actually involved a forester and the, and the logger and that was a essentially a high grade or a diameter limit cut. The forest that's on the other side of the road that's behind me was a beautiful forest of sugar maple and red oak and black cherry and you can see what it looks like when you cut out the red oak and the sugar maple and black cherry and what you're left with is beech and hemlock and red maple, none of it looking very good and then an understory that includes a lot of briars and beech brush and uh, undesirable vegetation that will interfere with the ability of the forest to regenerate. So one of these primary problems is high grading. You've, you'll hear this as diameter limit cutting. You'll hear it as selective cutting. Um, either however you define it or describe it, it's a destructive practice that reduces the productive potential of the forest. So it, it needs to be avoided. Um, and you'll you'll hear it referenced in terms of I'll cut the big ones and let the little ones go grow and cutting trees is good for wildlife and you've you've probably heard all those or seen reference to them. So here are uh, a variety of of webinars that address high grading. I gave a webinar on this topic in 2007, so an hour long session on this. Uh, Dr. Nyland, the silviculturalist at SUNY ESF, has given a webinar on it. Uh, Dr. Nyland's agreed to give another webinar uh, through the Forest Connect program later this spring. And uh, Dr. Jim Finley down at Penn State gave a webinar on this topic um, about a year ago. So these are resources that are available. Um, and this, again, if you want to save this file, if you go to the file uh, menu and do a save as, you can save this document as a PDF. Okay, so that's high grading. Uh, the threat number two is interfering vegetation. Interfering vegetation is a problem because it creates a low shade. That low shade has uh, profound physiological impacts because it changes both the quantity and quality of light that's available for hardwood seedlings. So those hardwood seedlings need some amount of light in order to be able to regenerate. In the presence of these low layers, whether in the upper left-hand corner it's ferns, in the uh, upper, as the upper left-hand corner, lower left-hand corner, uh, we have this 
dense layer uh, from about uh, 12 or 15 feet high down the ground, layer of striped maple and hornbeam and grasses and black birch, uh, or beech brush, and there's a lot of other species. These are all native species. There's a whole suite of non-native invasive plants that can also cause problems. Uh, they also create root competition, particularly the ferns, and then some of these create habitat conditions that are favorable to rodents that are going to be eating seeds and eating seedlings. So this is a problem, and these uh, interfering plants are uh, complicated by the third factor that we'll talk about in just a minute. These are, are, are um, accentuated by high grading and then they're, they also interact with the third option. So interfering vegetation has a low shade. It inhibits intolerant species. Many of the desirable species that we want, that we've come to appreciate in our forests, are intolerant of shade. Sugar maple is an example of a tolerant species, and, and, uh, but even that has a need for some amount of sunlight. The, the recommended, and it's very general, the details, devil's in the details, but you have to control an interfering vegetation before you're able to regenerate the forest. And as soon as you're thinking about the fact that your forest stand might be at an age when it's approaching maturity, you need to be thinking about controlling interfering vegetation. Those, those undesirable species are all tolerant of shade, and they can respond very quickly and positively to even partial uh, openings, small openings in the canopy of the forest uh, that don't allow enough sunlight for the intolerant, shade intolerant species to become established, but will allow these interfering plants to become dominant. There are different control methods. We're not going to go into those, but there are uh, mechanical control methods and chemical control methods. Depending upon what you want to accomplish, uh, you can mix and match or combine those different control strategies. Okay, so I've talked about some of these. I won't go into that in any more detail. Uh, we've talked about mechanical and chemical um, as the two different methods of control. Uh, that refers to the mechanism, the way that the interfering plant is actually um, managed. And then we have the mode is broken down as either broadcast or selective. So a selective mode means that you're able to individually pull out and or pinpoint a plant that's going to be treated. So you have mechanical selective and you have chemical selective. Broadcast treatments mean that you have this treatment that's applied to an area, and every stem that's within the swath of that treatment is going to be impacted. So a mechanical broadcast treatment is mowing. Uh, another an example of a chemical broadcast treatment would be a mist blower. So there are numerous uh, webinars that are available on this topic. And uh, I'll just call your attention to that. Many of these are listed also on the NIFOA web page. OK, so that was number two. Wrapping this up, number three, you've all probably seen these seedlings on stump sprouts. They're succulent looking. They're almost delicious looking if you look at them long enough and it's late enough in the day. And yet you notice that something's already nipped off the top of those. Similarly, you'll see seedlings. Uh, and these are actually pretty minor, where you see, you know, here's a, here's a stub, there's a double stem, um, there's a double stem, here's a double stem. Uh, these are plants that have all been browsed by deer. The impact of deer is significant. If we, if we think about what a deer needs to do, a uh, deer needs to eat, we'll say on average, seven pounds of fresh weight and forage per day. That's going to vary through the season. They won't always do that every day, but that's an average. And if we know that, that there are roughly 600 seedlings per pound, so if you see the, the seedlings that are in the backdrop of this presentation, you'll see a carpet of little red oak seedlings, and a deer will come along and nip off the top of those oak seedlings. It would take 600 of those to reach a pound. So you can see where I'm going with this, the math. Uh, that equates to, on average, or approximately 4,200 seedlings per deer per day if these deer feed exclusively in the forest. So this is, um, this is problematic, and if you multiply that out over a seven-month time period, we'll assume that the farmers are feeding 
uh, the deer through the generosity of hay and corn and soybeans during the growing season, but for seven months out of the year, these deer may be relying on those seedlings, and so an individual deer can consume uh, you know, something on the order of three quarters of a million seedlings each year. So this is, if you, have a, if you had one deer on a landscape, that wouldn't be a problem, but if you have 40 deer per square mile or 80 deer per square mile, deer are a huge impact on the forest. There are different ways that we can think about controlling the impacts of deer. We have tree tubes uh, is the focus on the tree. We have fencing, which again is focused on the, on the tree, and we have hunting, which is an effort to control the actual number of deer, particularly uh, efforts to harvest female deer doe so that you can uh, reduce the reproductive capacity of that deer herd, that deer population. And again, lots of good resources out there to, to guide you on uh, more conversations about deer management. So here are all of the resources that were listed in this presentation. Um, and if you want to do a save as on this document, because I'm going to be uh, jumping out of this mode here very quickly, so please do a save as. You can save it. And, or if you want, send me an email, and I will be happy to uh, send you a copy of this. So are there any questions? This, this lays out the framework, the problems that we're facing. And it's deer, it's interfering vegetation, and it's high grading. And they're going to vary in extent across the state, but uh, collectively they are major problems. We'll talk about at the end of this uh, webinar, there are some other things that people need to be aware of. But those are the big three, um, and any one of those in great enough extent can limit forest regeneration. And then a couple of them at moderate levels can also limit forest regeneration. What what the intent of the Restore New York Woodlands initiative is, is to be able to, um, is to be able to restore the forest to get beyond those particular threats. So let's look and see where we are on the agenda. So we've just picked off number one, and let's go now to number two, what is uh, restore New York Woodlands. So this is a page that I've extracted from the information packet, and we'll talk more about that information packet in just a minute. But the first paragraph, and you can read this for yourself, the first paragraph defines what is Restore New York Woodlands. Um, I'll paraphrase that and put my own kind of uh, spin on it, if you will. Uh, you may realize the New York Forest Owners Association is 50 years old in 2013, so it's been around for 50 years. And, and during those 50 years, NIFOA has played a profound role in being a conduit of bringing forest owners into the, to an interface with education through a variety of different educational resources, but that's been a driving force of NIFOA is through chapter activities, through state activities, is to educate people. That continues to be a driving force. And what Restore New York Woodlands does is it serves almost as a capstone to look at the efforts of 50 years and think about the, 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 the changes in the demographic of forest owners and the changes in the demographic of forests and say, here's a concern that needs to be address, addressed. There are problems in the forest. And what are the forests? It started really with asking the question, I think, what's the forest going to look like in 50 years? Right now we have second growth forests that followed agriculture, and agriculture followed the first growth or primary growth forests. And we have now the second growth forests. As these mature, something will happen in those forests. The question then is what will happen in those forests, and how will they be replaced, and with what will they be replaced when they're replaced, uh, either because they're being managed or because there's an insect defoliation or an ice storm or a windstorm, what will replace those forests? Will those, will that next uh, collection of plants provide the same um, values and benefits and services that we as woodland owners and we as society depend on? So it's both a capstone and it's a cornerstone. And as I said at the beginning, it's a very exciting initiative. And, and um, my compliments to NIFOA for launching this effort. 
So I think everybody's read that, and if you haven't read it, you can go to the file menu and save it as a document, and then read it later. Or you can grab it from the uh, information packet. So are there any questions uh, so far? I've, I've covered the, the first two items on the agenda, and I just want to pause and make sure there, everybody's with me, and looks like everybody's still with me. Well, seeing no questions, let's forge ahead. Let's jump back to the agenda. I got these little check marks. I might as well use them, right? Okay. All right. So we're going to move to resources. Let me shuffle my notes here. The, as I mentioned earlier, and just to reiterate here, the, the, NIFOA has this initiative or a program called Restore New York Woodlands, and there are activities that are part of that. Uh, there, are, uh, there are articles that are being written as part of the Forest Owner Magazine. There are fact sheets that are being developed. There are uh, member profiles that are profiling. Um, uh, members who are um, you know, who are who are doing things to try to regenerate their forest, and uh, we're developing a contest for tree growing, uh, and 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 so these are all activities within this program. The big activity, though, and the one that's really going to get I think the most publicity within the organization and within the state is what's be known as Woods Walk Weekend, which is taken generously to be actually two primary weekends in the middle of May or any weekend in any Woods Walk over the course of the year that focuses on um, focuses on uh, restoration and the need to restore the forest. So let's, Chris has a question. Uh, Chris says, was any consideration given to the effect of parcelization and forest fragmentation? So that is, uh, that's, that's certainly part of things that are going on. And that, um, so parcelization by itself, the, you know, the dividing up of parcels from a 50-acre parcel to two 25-acre parcels or five 10-acre parcels, um, in and of itself is not going to, just the changes in the boundary lines, I, I know you know this, um, changes in the boundary line are not going to degrade the forest. What happens, though, is that changes the manner in which people uh, manage that forest. And oftentimes, before it's parcelized, it's because it's transferring hands, and the owner has decided, well, I'm getting out of the woodlot business. They liquidate the timber, they parcelize it, or they put in building lots, and then that leads to fragmentation. So that's, that's certainly important. That hasn't been, in most cases, identified as, a, um, as an underlying mechanism of uh, degradation of the forest, but it certainly is a contributing factor. So thanks for bringing that up. Hang on just a second. OK, we're looking now at the resources. And uh, what I want to show you is uh, two different things. Uh, one is, and all of these again um, reside on the Restore New York Woodlands webpage. The, uh, the the primary document that's been developed to help assist with understanding Restore New York Woodlands, and then particularly to provide resources that are available to host sites for the Woods Walk Weekend is what's known as the Restore New York Woodlands Information Packet. And you can see a link to that PDF. I'm going to show it to you in just a minute. Uh, and then that's embedded with within the Restore New York Woodlands webpage. So if you just, you know, as I said earlier, the punchline here is become familiar with the Restore New York Woodlands webpage. The next several minutes, we're going to spend looking at portions of that webpage. So, 
Um, let me, we're going to do a share screen. And where it go? Clean up my screen here. There we are. Okay, so now you're going to look at a document that's on the screen of my computer. It's going to take just a minute for you all to look at this. Okay, is this, uh, can everybody see a document that's, here's the title page, Restore New York Woodlands. Can anybody see that? So you're all sitting there nodding your heads saying, yes, I can see it, but I don't know that. Thank you, Steve. Great. Chris, thank you. Okay. So this is what the cover page looks like. And let me take you through and look at a few particular pieces on this. Well, this is just what it is. Let me, um, it's 23 pages long. And this is the table of contents, so it, we've already looked at the page. Don't worry, we're not going to look at all 23 pages of this. I just want to acquaint you with what this document's going to look like. And, and we'll stop with the table of contents because you can go, you're certainly able to go and look at this for yourself. But just uh, there are, in addition to defining what the Restore New York Woodlands Initiative is, we have the forest restoration guides. These are guides that will help hosts and uh, walk facilitators, identify uh, potential woods walk locations, prepare for uh, prepare for those woods walk um, activities. Um, there's a uh, a table that that's a, a calendar, and we'll look at that in more detail in just a few minutes. That helps you set up a timeline for managing and preparing for that woods walk. Um, I should also say just before I forget. There's a green tab at the top of your screen, and if you run your cursor over that, you have the ability, some of you already figured this out, um, you have the ability, you can click on the chat button, and that will activate your chat pod. So feel free to do that. Um, okay, some other things, and there's additional supplemental information for the for the, in support of those guides. There's opportunities for um, uh, describing how to invite stakeholders, how to develop publicity for Restore New York Woodlands through the use of guest editorials. There are sample press releases. Uh, it'll, it will be, and it's, I guess, um, understood that the group is going to be, uh, whatever the local group is, the local team associated with the Woods Walk, they're going to be managing their own press releases and uh, there are samples here so that that can uh, be easier for you. So there's the planning guideline. There's some background material. So these are lists of articles and webinars and other publications. There's a little uh, discussion on the Council of Forest Resource Organizations. That's a uh, NGO kind of consortium. It's actually a consortium of NGOs uh, in some academic institutions. Uh, that's that's uh, trying to be a voice for forests and how they have reacted with and interacted with the healthy forest agendas. Um, and then finally, there's an example of the exit survey, the Restore New York Woodlands exit survey. So if you have a woods walk, uh, here's something that you can give to participants and, and, and the host sites are encouraged to have this available so that they can collect some baseline information about the number of people and the types of people and what their interests are uh, that participate. This is going to be a great resource for a local chapter because they can see the kinds of people and the kinds of interests that are, are present. And then there's some commentary on uh, liability issues. And just to set that to rest right now, all of these woods walks that are done under the auspices of NIFOA are covered by the NIFOA liability policy. 
So any, uh, w without going into greater detail, we'll look at a couple of pieces of this in just a minute, but any general questions about this uh, information packet? The inclusion of liability, I think, is important. My guess is, uh, and, it, and it's covered, as I said, it's covered in detail, um, because that's going to be one of the concerns that many people would have about inviting other people onto their property. Okay, well, seeing no questions, I'm going to stop sharing. This will take us back to the web page. I'll give you all a second to make sure this connects. All right, I'll assume you're all there. So we'll put a check mark by number one, and we'll go ahead and put a check mark by number two. Uh, this webinar, I hope, is going to be viewed as a resource, uh, and it's, it's being recorded as we speak, or as I speak, as you sit and nod your head. And the, uh, the link is going to be made available on the Restore New York Woodman's webpage. So if you're a master forest owner and you're going to be maybe working with a forest owner that's going to host a site, you might suggest they take a look at this to familiarize themselves with some of these resources. Or you're in my FOA chapter chair, you can um, share this with uh, people that may be offering woods walks within your chapter. So now what I'd like to do is we're going to jump over to the Restore New York Woodlands webpage, and we're going to look at these different items, uh, A, B, C, and D, and then there are pieces of those uh, individually that we'll look at. So we're not, going to, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because I want to make sure that we have uh, time for questions and you know, also some wrap up some other things. So we're going to... Uh, Do another screen share. Okay, so now you are looking at the NIFOA web page. All right, Ken has a great question, how my property can only uh, hold about 50 cars or trucks, how do I contain the audience? Well, uh, there's a couple ways you can go about doing that. And first, uh, congratulations to you and thank you for offering your site as a Woods Walk location. Uh, a couple of strategies you can use, um, one is that you can, uh, you could request um, pre-registration. Um, you would do this as part of the press release and then that way you would, um, you, you, would, you would have a sense of the number of people and as the, you wouldn't necessarily have to set a limit in the press release but you could ask that people pre-register and when you started getting to um, you know, numbers that you think are pushing your threshold then you could um, you know, suggest to people that uh, the parking's going to be limited. Probably you should tell all people that because the people that call late may be the ones that arrive early. Um, but just communicate with them what they can expect is the best way to do it. Uh, you may want to talk to some, obviously, or certainly talk to your neighbors if you think that you're going to be uh, potentially stretching up and down the road just so they're aware of what's going on. In fact, invite your neighbors, uh, hopefully, to come and be part of that woods walk. So. Uh, we're going to be hosting a woods walk on our property, and I plan to be inviting our neighbors as well. So uh, that's a great question. If somebody else has uh, comments on that, feel free certainly to add them in. I, I you know, in, in the woods walks that I've been to, parking is important. I think if you can hold 50 cars, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape. Um, the concern is it's going to be middle May, and depending upon what the weather is, 
I've been in situations where you know you get a couple of inches of rain and where you think you could hold 50 cars now, maybe you're down to 20 or 25 cars on the really solid ground. Uh, be prepared to to um, exclude people from certain areas if you have wet soil conditions. Uh, people would be it's time well saved to have them park out on the gravel road or you know talk to your neighbor and see if you could use a, a dry pasture that they have or something like that um, rather than getting people stuck and then spending you know the the end of the afternoon borrowing a tractor and using your tractor to pull people's out so Chris asks if a particular property is a popular place can landowner hope host walk on both week the weekends absolutely absolutely so the um, and, and maybe what you would do, Chris, in a case like that, if it's going to be a popular place, is in, on on one day you might focus on one particular topic, whatever that might be. I mean, maybe it would be uh, wildflowers, um, and then when you're talking about wildflowers, you can talk about the impacts of deer on wildflowers because it's it's not just about. And I I'm remiss in overstating timber species. It's not just about the need to restore and regenerate timber species, but the full diversity of desirable plant species. So maybe on the first weekend your focus is on wildflowers and on the second weekend your focus is on something else. And then that way if people have a particular interest, they can come for that particular interest, but you can also work in some of these other topics. So, but absolutely, you can, you can do as many woods walks as you want. Um, but it might also be fun to mix it up a little bit if you have multiple landowners that are willing to host. Um, and there's a there's a note from Jim Miner. Hi, Jim. Glad you could join us. Jim is the webmaster, and my uh, um, kudos for Jim for setting up a really fabulous web page. We'll talk in a minute about the map and how to register those particular sites. If you are going to use the same site. Um, uh, notify Jim Miner and he can set it up so that you'll see two points will show up on the map. Uh, they'll show up as two as different as I recall different colors. Steve said what is a most likely number to expect based on past experience? Um, that's the million dollar question Steve. So we've I've been on woods walks in the far northern stretches of Franklin County where you could look into Quebec um, and we had 90 people show up at that woods walk. Uh, that was a surprise. That was the biggest one. Um, I co-hosted a woods walk in, in here in central New York and we had two people that showed up. So there's a, obviously a range. The, I guess the, the, the point of that is that that this May is a good time to get people out in the woods. People have a little bit of cabin fever, there, and you can you can market it, you know, to get out and stretch your legs in the woods and look at wildflowers and learn about trees and talk about wildlife. Uh, kind of get a sense of what people are interested in your local area. Get the press releases out. Um, work with the penny savers. Talk, call your local. TV and radio stations and newspaper, they're always looking for special interest stories. Uh, the beauty of these woods walks is, is you as an individual and the host site and IFOA are not trying to sell anything. So this is, this is a wholesome opportunity that you're uh, making available your, um, uh, making available your property to these people. And, uh, and it'll, I think it'll, you'll find that it's going to be quite well received. We'll take a, a look at the press releases here in just a, a minute, so we'll we'll come back to that. Okay, those are great questions. Feel feel free to keep um, pumping those questions in. All right, so this is the home page for the NIFOA website. You're looking at my uh, web page, and uh, again, I'll just caution you. I don't know if you're able to click this page or not. Um, please don't. It's not going to hurt my page, but it might get you off into a corner where you can't come back from. So let me do the clicking. This is the Restore New York Woodlands uh, homepage as a, as a subpage within NIFOA. And again, here, if this is the punchline of the webinar. If you get lost or you get sidetracked or you lose sound, come back to this and spend 
uh, 20 minutes snooping around on this. You won't get through it all in 20 minutes, but it will give you a sense of the of the richness and variety uh, and, and depth of content that's available here. So the first thing I wanted to cover is to go over the uh, what we would call the, the resources that define the problem, that defines the need for problems. Those exist in two different places. The first bullet is uh, to read the summaries about the problem. One of those, and I'll click on this. I think this will work. We'll find out. All right, so this is, I'll let everybody get a chance for your screens to upload. Sometimes this takes five or ten seconds. You should be seeing a page that says New York's Forests and Endangered Species. Anybody see that? All right, Chris, Mark, thank you. So this is this defines it. This is a, a one-page document, and it it covers uh, it covers what I would have covered, you know, in the webinar. There, the I mean, Bonnie Blatter has nothing. Steve says yes. So Bonnie, maybe you're. Oh, Bonnie's nodding. Okay, <laughs> very good. Thank you. I sensed that you were. So this gives a one-page summary. This would be great as a handout to have available on your website. Let me go back and show you another resource that's a, a summary of the problem. So this is clicking the second button. This is a uh, trifold brochure. And you can print this off and you can duplicate copies. There are some copies that are, uh, that are made and those are um, available on a limited basis, but I think the plan is to send uh, quantities to each of the different chapter chairs and then they can distribute those as they like. Let me scroll down to the next page. So that's that's the kind of the outside. This is the inside and you can see that New York forests are beautiful, important, um, but they're also threatened and then this goes into additional detail about white-tailed deer and interfering vegetation and tree cutting methods and things like that. So it's a very general audience uh, type of brochure. It's, it's uh, low on jargon, low on terminology, but if we uh, think that it's going to capture the essence of, of what's happening there. Okay, the, uh, the second a uh, resource that's available that describes the, the issues or the concern is the bottom bullet under technical resources. Uh, okay, Jim, Jim has a point. Uh, there's going to be uh, the option for distribution to chapter chairs uh, of that flyer will be at the March 23rd NIFOA annual meeting. So if you all are haven't already planned or registered to go to that meeting on March 23rd, please do that. And I, I bet there's a link on the web page to, uh, to do that. Okay, under technical resources, we'll click on that. Uh, these uh, technical resources cover a number of different topics that in essence define the problem. Some of, not all of them here do that. These are generally just technical resources related to forest regeneration and forest restoration. But you see here, for example, um, uh, so an article that Gary and I wrote about anticipating the next forest and then the webinar at the bottoms, there are two different webinars, one uh, managing for the next forest, the, the brief uh, set of slides that I showed earlier was a portion of that actual webinar. So these are some other resources. The reason why you would want to know about the statement of the problem is because somebody might, and we'll talk about this at the, towards the end, somebody's going to ask the question, well, is this really a problem? Why do we need to Okay, I need to talk a little bit faster or we're going to run out of time, aren't we? All right, the second resource that I want to talk about, and this I think is a very cool part of the site, is uh, the resource that's the map of host sites. So that's the second bullet. It says join us for a guided walk in a nearby woodland. And the bottom line says click here to see a map. So let me show you that map. 
Well, no, I'll show you the page that's going to show us the map. Okay, so the first bullet under site information says see where sites have already volunteered to host Woods Walks. We'll click here. So this shows a map of the state. I'll give this a minute to load. Let, let me know when you're able, when you can see the map of the state with the different colored dots. All right, good. So a couple of points to make uh, on this. Uh, first, the color coding uh, corresponds to a particular date. And uh, so the red, the red dots are May 11th, the blue dots are May 18th, and so forth. Um, another point to make is that not all sites have been registered yet. So if, if you're planning to register a site and you haven't done that, please do so. We'll, I'll show you next how to do that. Um, uh, but it's important to do that for two reasons. One, because there's going to be, uh, you can imagine there's going to be a need to get some targeted communication out to people uh, as a group, to all of the host sites, so it's essential to have your contact information. Uh, the second important reason is that you're looking at it, right? This is a map, and the, the marketing that's going to happen, the press releases are going to be driving people to the MyFOA website. People are going to look at this and they're going to say, oh, well, I live in the Watertown area and there's no woods walks near me. I guess I'll just give up. Well, if you're offering a woods walk in the Watertown area and you don't show up on the map, then nobody's going to know that you're there. So this is, it's important to use multiple avenues to advertise. Otherwise, um, Otherwise, you know, you can do a press release, and a press release will get to some people. But we were talking earlier about how do we get uh, get a turnout? We well, get a turnout by using multiple modes of advertising. So, and Ken says he's registered in Blue and Zor Valley. So I think if we cursor over, so Stephen Jacoby's in there. He's H. I'm going to click on one of these and see what happens. I'll click on ours or A. All right, so there, when you click on one of these, you should see, uh, I'll give you a minute for this to upload. Uh, so you'll see a dialog box that has uh, information that describes the details of the, of the actual Woods Walk. Can everybody see that dialog box or that, I don't know what's called, some, a pop-up box or something? All right, Steve, you can see that. Mark, good. So you can you can imagine this is a very powerful tool, and it's going to be an important tool for people to connect with you as the host of a Woods Walk site. So let's just say, for instance, you want to register and you haven't. How can you do that? You go to the second black bullet. It says interested in volunteering. The second bullet, click here to get started. Here's an online form that allows you to uh, provide your registration name, the owner's name. So it may, be that, it may be that you're an educator or you're a forester or an MFO or a chapter chair and you're registering a site on behalf of, um, on behalf of the actual um, uh, owner. So anyway, we have contact information for whoever's submitting it as well as uh, contact information for the Woodswalk site itself. And Jim Miners added a uh, comment there about clicking on the text address and the pop-up. It'll take you to a Google map. So there's multiple layers of information in that Google map. So, okay, so you know how to register your site. You know what your site is going to look like when it shows up. So please, uh, if you haven't done that, please do that. There are, you know, there are We've heard reports through email and conversations that there are numerous sites that haven't yet registered. Please take the time to do that. Okay, um, another resource, let me back up, are uh, research studies and testimonials. So 
That's the third bullet. You say the, see the bolded word C research. So if you want to have a quick link, uh, first off to those two studies that I mentioned, the first one at Cornell, the second one from the Nature Conservancy. If you want to read those in, in all of their detail, please do that. It, would, it will provide you some additional insights. Uh, or you can read some, uh, some summaries of that. There's a frequently asked questions that I, that I wrote under the first bullet of articles. I'll just open that up, not because I wrote it, but because it's designed to try to answer some of the questions. This is about 10 pages, it'll take a minute. It's designed to try to answer some of the questions that could possibly come up with uh, people that are, are exploring this topic. So it's generally restoring New York woodlands. And the first question is, is there something wrong with New York woodlands? These questions were developed in part, there was a, a group of NIFOA members that participated in, a, uh, in, a, in an event in um, Livingston County. Am I in the right county? Yes, Livingston County last fall. They had a booth that was put up, a little display, talked about restoring the forest, and as people came by, had knew nothing about forest, it was, it was the Fiddler Fair at Chuck Winship's Sugarbush Hollow, and people would come by, they were there for the fiddling and for a walk in the woods in a September day, and they'd talk about restoring the woods, and some of these questions came up, so this is an effort to answer some of those questions. So it, it's, um, it's, it provides a perspective on that. Uh, Jerry Michael has also written an article. Uh, there's an article, or a, a monograph actually, that Mike Grayson and Carl Wiedemann and Jim Kufall wrote, talked about the hidden disaster, that disaster being uh, destructive harvesting practices. Uh, Jim Miner and Jerry Michael have another article about the uh, Woods Walk, uh, uh, Woodlands, uh, New York Woodlands Initiative in the November, December issue of, of the Forest Owner. And then, Related to this, we have a number of forest owners who have been profiled over the last uh, several issues, and they were picked because they had some element of dealing with managing these uh, challenges and problems. So they're you know they're good examples to see of people and see what they're doing, and, and it's it's always a fun time to go steal ideas from other folks. Okay, that was. Item C on research studies and testimonials. So the final uh, set of resources I want to go over are technical resources. So the first technical resource is what we're looking at, okay? And that's um, you know you're, you're gaining familiarity with it. I'm clicking the buttons. It's not going to mean anything until you come back and you click those buttons. So please uh, plan on spending. I'd allocate at least. Uh, 20 or 30 minutes to just exploring it so you know what's here and then set time aside to go back and read some of the pertinent documents. This is going to be important if you're hosting or if you're facilitating one of these woods walks because people will have questions and then you will want to be able to direct them to additional resources. You're not expected to have all of the answers to all of the questions, but it's nice to be able to direct people to these other resources. Okay. Another uh, resource that I'll call your attention to, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click on a new tab. Hopefully, everybody stays with me. This is my Forest Connect website. Let me know when you can see the Cornell University Cooperative Extension Forest Connect website. Okay, Bonnie can see it, Steve can see it, great. All right, so this has uh, a couple of things I want to call your attention to. Uh, one is, and these are resources that you might be interested in. Some of you are already familiar with these. Uh, they might be resources that you're interested in. They might also be resources that you direct people to. So part of the the power of these woods walks is that you're going to be talking one-on-one, -on -one, uh, peer to peer with other landowners. And that's one of the most powerful ways to convey information and to educate other people. I mean, think about when, when you want to get educated, if you have somebody that you have some confidence in, that has some 
that has gained your trust, you're going to value what they have to say. You may find other information, but it may be that they say, hey, you need to go check something out. You believe them as a, as a personal source, and so you're going to follow up on the resource. So one of the resources that you can direct them to are webinars. So if you look in this list on the left, it's the fourth, one, two, three, four, fourth button down. So we'll click on webinars. And what you should see now is a page that describes the Forest Connect uh, Forestry Internet Seminar Series. And then if you look towards the bottom, you'll see how you can register for those webinars, how you can view the scheduled and saved uh, past conferences. So we're not going to click through all of those, but just know that this is an option for you. Going back to the home site, the, uh, the second resource that you would want to look at are the publications. So here is a list of, of uh, essentially everything, almost everything that I've ever written and that many other people have also ever written. And it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's almost overwhelming. So we're in the process of actually redesigning this web page so that you can find things more easily. You can see that the categories up at the top include agroforestry and woodlot management and climate change and vegetation management, forest health, the fact sheet series. So all of the fact sheets that you've seen are all available as downloadable PDFs. So you can, you can read this as well as I can. So um, again, these are resources. If, if somebody uh, has a general interest in uh, forests and forestry, they want to do some reading, I send them to the woodlot section in that very first bullet, Enhancing Forest Stewardship. That's a 100-page bulletin that has about 15 different articles on everything from how to hire a forester to how to arrange a timber sale to woodland wildlife. So that's it's a great free um, one-stop for some introductory level information about this resource. OK, um, the next resource that I want to call your attention to is our Ning site. And you can get there um, uh, by going to that link is cornellforestconnect.ning.com. The Ning.com series is a commercial uh, hosted site. It's like Facebook as a social media, but the, uh, the Ning site has some added advantages, I think, in terms of its security. Uh, what you'll want to look at are, OK, so I want to make sure everybody's with me on the Cornell Forest Connect Ning site. So you'll see a, a scrolling set of pictures in the upper left-hand corner. OK, Jim's got it, good. Uh, two particular things that will be of interest to you, and you can see the tabs across the top. One, are, uh, one tab to look at are the events. So I'll click on the events. So this gives you a, a longitudinal view of events that are coming up. You can see that tomorrow we have the Yates County Forestry Workshop. Some of you, uh, that's the day after tomorrow. Um, so some of you in the Finger Lakes may want to scurry up to uh, the Yates County Forestry Workshops. Uh, March 8th, the uh, Catskill uh, in the Catskill Mountains, probably Catskill Forest, the Catskill Forest Association is having an alternative energy workshop. And you can read down through those. The point is that um, you could post your own individual woods walk on this site. And that would be a great thing to do. Um, and, and then there's redundancy. So people can find it on, it's already going to be on the NIFOA page, so you don't technically have to do that. But if somebody looks and finds it here but not there, redundancy is a good thing. I will, for each of the dates where there are anything going on, so that's May 11th, May 12th, May 18th, and May 19th, I will add an entry here that will drive people to the NIFOA site. So you know, as, as you're familiar with the with the social media, it's all about moving people to the correct place. So I'll add those. I will take responsibility for making sure uh, they won't have any of the specific workshops, although I'll put our specific workshop, Woods Walk, up there, I mean, um, so 
I will, you know, I won't put any specific woods woods walks up. I'll just put a link for each date. So if somebody finds this calendar and they say, hey, what's going on on May 12th? They'll be able, they'll be directed to the Mayfellow website. Okay, so that's one option. Another thing, and this is if you have another resource, if you have people that have questions, and you're on your woods walk, and somebody says, hey, tell me about whatever. Uh, I have a question and you don't know the answer, you can say go to the Cornell Forest Connect.ning website and they have a questions page and that questions page is basically a online forum. And this is a moderated forum that I and uh, Gary and several cooperative extension educators moderate so when questions come up we're, um, we will respond and it's uh, you know maybe that they have a question on woodlot management, so we click on woodlot management, and you can sort these by latest activity, or I'm going to change it to we'll see what the most popular topic is and most popular in terms of replies. Um, uh, dealt with using glyphosate to control beach, and the second one was where do I start? This was somebody in uh, Schoharie County, and they own 130 acres. And they don't know what to do. I mean, that's a that's a, a perfect uh, question that you might receive as part of your woods walk. Somebody, a neighbor, sees it, and they think, "Hey, well, I've got you know 50 acres or five acres or 150 acres, and here's a woods walk. I'm going to go talk to them about how to get started." There's other resources there. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing this, and we're going to go back to. All right, we'll go back to um, our page. So we've had the statement of problems. These are all resources. The map, the research site, under technical resources, we're down here to those. And you can see that there are other resource people that I've listed. So there are local foresters, uh, public sector as well as private sector. There are cooperative extension educators. There are master forest owner volunteers. And there are NIFOA chapter chairs. These are all people you could imagine building a team that would come together in support of each woods walk. These are all individuals that you might want to have as part of your team. Okay, um, let's go back to the agenda and see where we are. We're at 820 and we're going kind of, going, time's going fast, content is going slow. But we're having, um, I hope, some useful information. Let me just pause here. Are there any questions about um, well, what we've covered so far? All right, thank you, Chris. Okay, uh, I think because uh, we're down to 10 minutes, um, I'm gonna we'll, we're gonna go back to the information packet for item number four. So I'm gonna share an application, and that's gonna be the info packet. And there are we're gonna look at four specific pages on this. So go ahead. I have to turn my chat pod back on. I don't know if you have to do that or not. So the first page I want to look at is page four. And we're not going to read this, but page four, this is uh, this is the guide for Woods Walks leaders. And there are three guides that are in, that are being developed. One of them is completed and it's in here. This is a guide for people that are going to lead a woods walk or, or help lead a woods walk on a, uh, a private individual's property. So it would be uh, intended for audiences that are the general public and members of organizations. You can see guides one, two, and three there. Um, guide number two has been developed. That uh, Gary Goff and I are working on that with Jerry Michael. Uh, we've put the finishing touches on it, but it, we haven't kind of gone live with it yet. And then guide three is going to be a variation of guide two uh, specifically divine, designed for MFOs who are making visits to a particular property. So these will all be uh, available to you in, in a short order.
to assist you. Uh, and if you scrolled, if we scrolled to the next page, you would see some of the details. For for example, it, the, the guide leads you through the objectives that you want to accomplish when you're hosting a Woods Walk. It covers some agenda items. So most of the hard work has been done, and uh, it's 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 fairly much a turnkey operation. Obviously, you're going to want to read, going to want to read through this and customize it to fit your own particular location. Okay, the next thing I want to show is on page 17. This is a table that helps uh, helps you set up essentially a checklist for getting ready with your team of people to put on a woods walk. You'll see that it starts at six months lead time. We're already within six months. If you're going to be hosting in May, uh, don't despair. Uh, most of the work has already been done. A lot of the the, and we'll look at press releases next, but a lot of the preparatory work has been completed, so if you're just getting started, you still have plenty of time, but you do want to take some immediate action. And you can see there's timelines for six months, activities six months before the Woods Walk, three months before the Woods Walk, two months, one month, and all the way down to the kind of the last minute details. So um, take advantage of that. And then the final item of this information packet that I want to show you, these are press releases and, um, and other publicity information. I think if we go up the page, so we can talk about publicity through guest editorials. This is where you would reach out to your local penny saver. And, and all the local papers, these are monthly papers or weekly papers, they're starving for information. So if you went to them and you had a story such as you see here, New York's forests are an endangered, are they an endangered species question mark? This is going to be really powerful for them. Uh, it comes with the credibility of the New York Forest Owners Association and a, and a statewide initiative. Um, I, I have to believe you're going to find success in getting this published. Reach out, build those connections. This is important because it's a way that you can further uh, interface with the public and have somebody do the writing on your behalf or writing in support of what you're doing. So don't be bashful. Um, you have a, a solid message to deliver and you can, um, you can work that in your local community. You can also use these sample press releases. There are different examples of these. Um, you will have to you know, cut and paste the information and customize it so that it all makes sense. Uh, there are two examples on that page and then the third example here. So there's three different examples at least of things that you can use. You're not obligated to use these if you like to write press releases or you've seen a really good press release and you want to you know, put that spin on it, please do it. The thing to do is that you want to obviously try to get people to go to the NIFOA.org website uh, because they may not go on the walk, but they may go and get additional information. So these are right; these are samples, and um, you will want to give the date and the time. Uh, you may, you can decide if you want to give your phone number. Um, uh, and I would say if you may want to give a little information about, you know, here it talks about participate in a tree identification contest. If you have steep terrain or you're going to be walking on, um, you know, you're going to walk for half a mile or you're going to walk, don't probably don't take people on a three mile hike. That's too much. But give them some information about what they can expect. Um, you know, tell them what they're going to do and then tell them what they're going to learn as well. And Jim, thank you, Jim, is pointing out that press release is going to be um, uh, distributed by the um, by my fellow president, Jim, to all of the New York State dailies in mid-March. So uh, if you're going to have availability of restrooms or refreshments, mention that. You're not, it's not necessary that you have restrooms. Uh, if you don't have them, um, you may want to mention it in the press release and you know tell people how they're going to manage nature uh, as things happen. So, okay, let's uh, let me stop sharing this and go back to the web page. Um, I can so we did that. Now we're going to cover number five. 
uh, myths and misunderstandings. Uh, myth might be too strong of a word, but there you're going to be confronted with people that say, uh, in general, things like there isn't a problem, or um, you know I have the, the you know when I drive around the, the forests are green, and so they're they're going to have some kind of general level concerns that. Um, that, that need to be addressed. And so the, the supplemental material that's in the information packet, the technical resources that are on the web page, that will help you respond to some of that information. There are going to be other concerns that are specific. And they're specific to the issues that um, are identified as part of the Restore New York Woodlands Initiative, dealing with particularly deer interfering vegetation and high grading. So these, uh, this is a, a three-page handout. And again, if you want, you can go to, uh, I, I'll be, um, we'll send this to Jim Miner and, and he can post it on the Restore New York Woodlands webpage. If you want to print a copy now, go to the File menu in the upper left-hand corner, Save as Document, and you can save this as a PDF. Oops, I put a check mark there. So one concern is that NIFO is promoting promoting the elimination of deer from the landscape. And I'm not going to read through all these details. We'll, we'll look at each of those questions. Some people, there are uh, deer hunters out there that think that there are not enough deer. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's a worthy concern. Um, but it, it, it's also an opportunity to have a conversation with these people um, so that they can understand our perspective as forest owners. Another concern is about the use of chemical methods, and people may be, um, because of the publicity, may be reluctant to use uh, chemical methods, but um, uh, the, and, and want to, to favor non-chemical methods. And in some situations, that will work fine. Uh, the, the point here is, is that NIFO is not promoting the use of chemicals, but it's recognizing that that is a legitimate tool and that there's a process that people should go through before they undertake the use of any kind of chemical methods. Something I should mention about the deer, most of us are deer hunters as well. So it's not that we're anti-deer hunting, but we're looking for that balance, right? We want to find the balance between a healthy deer herd and a healthy forest. And then the third concern is um, about a discrimination against di diameter limit cutting and a, a desire to um, impede financial gain, and that's obviously not the case. So these are um, these are three concerns. Uh, you could read these. You could have these um, available as handouts. You could just be familiar with the contents and think about. It's not having an argument. It's having a conversation. Um, and, and the first time you have a conversation with somebody, you may start to shift them a little bit, and they, and then you can direct them. Don't try and you know, don't try and hit a home run. Get them to be to open their minds and get them to go look at some other resources that are available. Okay, back to the agenda and wrapping up. And it's 11, not 11:30, 8:30. Um, so we did the myths, uh, and I'll just mention. And this was I wasn't planning to do anything more than this. Uh, there are other factors that are important, and, and Chris brought up a good point earlier about uh, forest parcelization and fragmentation. There are certainly other factors that impact the regeneration of the forests. Uh, deer and high grading and interfering vegetation are the big three that have widespread um, uh, widespread spread presence in New York. And uh, there are also three that, that are relatively easily addressed. And there are three that, when they are addressed, tend to result in favorable reproduction. That's not all, though. And so um, people may bring up things such as soil chemistry and acid rain. And in some cases, uh, there's a, a scientist at Cornell, Tim Fahey, who's working in New Hampshire on very nutrient poor soils. And they would regenerate sugar maple. They would thin it in the woods, the seedlings would stagnate. And then they did a liming experiment, and the seedlings grew. So it was that was a lime-limited, a pH-limited soil. 
So these, the point is these other factors can have an influence on regeneration. We're not dismissing them, uh, but they're, um, uh, they're either of, of lower magnitude or of lesser ability for us to try to manage them. So with that, I'm two minutes over, but I have nothing else to do, so I'm happy to stick around. Hopefully there are some questions from people and uh, or comments or ideas. And um, I'd like to, again, thank my FOA for, for undertaking this initiative. This is very exciting. It's absolutely the right thing to do, and um, I'm excited to be part of it. So. Stephen, thank you. Glad you could join us this evening, and uh, thank you for for offering to host a site. Thank you, Dave. And Dave, you uh, will recognize some of your materials were part of those materials. So thanks for thanks for your involvement with that. And there were several people that were involved in this. I um, again, I'm playing just a, I'll say a minor supporting role. There's a lot of people who've done a lot of work. Um, and, it, and they deserve the credit. All right. Yes, Ken. So I will be uh, Saturday. Some of you might be going to Yates County. Gary and I and uh, Christy Sullivan are going to be in Arcade at the Pioneer High School for the oh, rural landowner. Okay. All right. Well, it doesn't seem that there are any questions, but what I'll suggest is um, I think you all, all of you have my email. Let me type it in here in case somebody. Somebody watches the archive, they'll see my email, and uh, maybe Jim, if you want to type your email in, and anybody else who wants to type in, um, uh, anybody else who wants to type in their email in case people have questions or or thoughts. Also, there is a um, oh gosh, I can't remember. There's a um, there's a Restore New York Woodlands uh, Gmail account. And I don't know how quickly I can find it. It's think, 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 think. My brain's this is a tough time of day to try to remember something like a Gmail email account I don't usually use. All right, so Jim's got one. There we go. President at myfoa.org. So that'd be good and easy to find. All right, well, I will, um, all right, here we go. Restoring New York Woodlands at gmail.com. So restoring New York Woodlands at gmail.com. Ken Gaines has it, all right. And there's, it's New York's is plural. Oops, I misspelled it. New York. It should be New York's. Okay, well, I'll officially call this to a close. I'll turn off the recording.